Good, e good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, seminar. Uh, it's uh, titled Not Set in Stone, New Perspectives in Scotland's Rock Art. Uh, and it's, this one is going to be presented by members of the Scotland's Rock Art Project. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, uh, I'd uh, like to just give you a little bit of background uh, to this event. The webinar is organised by the Scotland's Rock Art Project. It's a five-year programme working with communities across the country to record, research and raise awareness of prehistoric carvings in Scotland. The project is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It's run by Historic Environment Scotland in collaboration with the Edinburgh University and the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, other members of the Scotland's Rock Art Project team are here this evening, so I'll introduce everyone. Uh, I'm Stuart uh, from Glasgow School of Art, one of the two uh, co-investigators co for the project. With me tonight, we also have uh, Guillaume Robin from uh, Edinburgh University, uh, who is also a co-investigator in the project, uh, and he'll also be moderating uh, the webinar tonight. Also, we have, of course, Tersha, our principal investigator in the project, Joanna, our uh, research assistant, as well as Linda, who, who's our data analyst, um, and uh, possibly Freddie. <laughs> uh, so this is the final year of uh, Scotland's Rock Art Project, and we've been running various events to promote and celebrate prehistoric rock art in Scotland and the work of the project in our community teams. Throughout the year, we've been running these monthly webinars presented by experts from Britain and Europe and themes relevant to Scotland's rock art. You can find more details uh, on the webinar series, uh, along with the recordings of the webinar series. All the previous webinars are actually available now on our website's uh, event page. Tonight's talk, uh, I'm sad to say, is the final one of our series. Uh, and because of that, we wanted to use this opportunity to focus on the work that Scotland's Rock Art Project has been doing over the last five years and to coincide with the end of the project, which is actually in just a couple of weeks time. Uh, before we meet tonight's speakers, before I introduce the speakers, there's just a few housekeeping things to be aware of. Uh, we're recording this talk uh, and it will be posted along with the other webinars uh, on the Scrap website uh, later on this week. To avoid background noise, uh, you'll be muted throughout the webinar and your videos are actually turned off. Please use the chat box if you want to talk to each other, you want, you want to tell us uh, where you're joining from tonight. Uh, and also use the chat box to flag up any uh, technical issues to do with uh, audio or anything similar to that. Uh, obviously, keep the chat uh, appropriate and relevant. Uh, uh, and importantly, don't, don't post any URL links or follow any URL links that are not posted by the team, just in case there's a possibility of spam being posted in there. Uh, if you want to avoid the comments chat popping up, as, as they come in, you can actually open the chat box and just leave it in the right of the screen and you won't be distracted by the, by the chat in that way if you prefer. If you want to ask a question of the speaker, or speakers in this case, um, please use the Q&A function. So down at the bottom of the screen, next to the chat, there's a little Q&A button. Uh, if you post questions in there, at the end of the, the session, I'll pose those to the, uh, the speakers. So I think we've got quite a full programme tonight, so I can't guarantee how many of those uh, we're going to get uh, through. So in short for that, um, chats go in the chat. I can see people are busy chatting away right now, which is great. And questions go in the Q&A box as well. So I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers, Tersha Barrett, Joanna valdes tullett and Linda Birkevet. And they're going to talk to us on the topic of not set in stone, new perspective in Scotland's rock art. Just some very brief biographical information on the speakers for those of you who don't know. Tersha, our principal investigator, who's been leading this project um, with an expert hand over the last five years. She's been researching and recording rock art in Britain and North Africa for over 20 years, focusing especially in post paleolithic carvings and community engagement with rock art. Before developing the SCRAP project, she also managed several community-led projects, including the Northumberland and Durham Rock Art Project and Scotland's Rural Past. She's currently based at Historic Environment Scotland, but she's also an honorary fellow at Edinburgh University's School of History, Classics and Archaeology. 
Joanna, who's been the research system, the research assistant throughout the project, uh, has been working in Rockart since 2003, studying and investigating sites from a number of European countries and periods, including the Paleolithic. Her specialism is on Atlantic rock art, on which she's just published a volume, oh, she published a volume in 2019 based on her PhD thesis. Joanna is also interested in computer applications in archaeology, archaeological theory, and the intersection between archaeology and contemporary art. Linda, who is our data analyst on the SCRAP project, she's a Norwegian archaeologist with an MSc in landscape uh, archaeology from the Free Universität in Berlin. Her primary interests are in digital mapping, survey, and community outreach, backed up by a keen desire to disseminate research in a way that is engaging and accessible. For her postgraduate thesis, she performed statistical and spatial analysis on large data sets through a multi-scalar approach uh, using QGIS and R. Linda is particularly eager to explore how people's relationship with their landscapes is expressed through rock art. So that's, uh, that's the, the project members who will be uh, speaking tonight. And it uh, is with great pleasure uh, that I will ask Tersha to start the presentations. Thank you, Stuart. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening for our final webinar in the series, and also the final event of Scotland's Rock Art Project, which, as Stuart said, ends in just over two weeks' time. The um, Scotland's Rock Art Project, or SCRAP, as you might hear us referring to it, started in January 2017. And tonight, we're really pleased to talk to you about the work that we've been doing over the last five years and to share the results of our analysis with you. We, we have a lot to say, um, so this talk will last a bit longer than the other webinars we've hosted in this series. Although the talk is being presented by myself, Joanna and Linda, it represents the work of the whole SCRAP team, past and present. You can see the names here on the opening slide, if, uh, if we can settle on that one, um, as well as all our community teams and our colleagues from Historic Environment Scotland and the many others who've contributed uh, to the project. So I'm, I'm going to kick off with some general background to prehistoric art in Scotland and what SCRAP has been doing. Then I'll hand over to Joanna and Linda to talk about our research objectives and results. So if we can have the first slide, please, Joanna. Um, there are over 3,000 prehistoric carved rocks or panels known in Scotland today. And the, these records have been collected over the last 200 years by antiquarians, professional organisations, independent researchers and members of the public. But this is only probably a tiny proportion of the original quantity of rock art in Scotland. Lots of panels have been destroyed, others may have eroded away completely, and many are likely to be covered by turf, peat or vegetation, or have yet to be discovered. As you can see from the distribution map on the left, um, there's rock art kind of across Scotland, but it has a very uneven distribution. And the density map on the right of the screen shows where there are large concentrations. Um, so these are the kind of red blobs. Um, and these are particularly in certain areas um, around Loch Tay, um, in Kilmartin, and in Kakubri in Dumfries and Galloway at the bottom of the screen. But there are smaller clusters in many other areas, such as Aberdeenshire and Angus in eastern Scotland, and also large swathes of the country which have very limited or apparently no rock art at all, uh, such as the central and northwestern highland region of Scotland. But the work of our community teams has revealed that some regions, such as eastern highland around Inverness, have many more examples of rock art than we already thought, than we originally thought. Next slide, please. Um, prehistoric rock art in Scotland was created in the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, so roughly between roughly 6,000 and 4,000 years ago. The rock art's almost entirely abstract carvings comprised uh, mainly of circular shapes um, or motifs. Um, it's characterised by cup marks, which are small circular hollows carved into the rock. And these are often surrounded by one or more concentric rings, frequently with grooves extending uh, from the cup marks or from the rings or connecting or enclosing motifs on the rock surface. 
but there are lots of subtle variations on these basic motif types, things like gapped rings, partial rings and rosettes. And you can see in the top left image, uh, there's some nice examples of rosettes where you've got a, a circle of cups around a central cup, sometimes with a ring around them. There's also a lot of variation in the way the motifs are combined and arranged and their relationship to natural features on the rock surface. And Joanna will be talking about, uh, about this in a lot more detail shortly. The panels can be very simple, uh, just a single cut mark or very elaborate with multiple interconnected motifs, which might cover the entire rock surface. The, the majority of the motifs are, uh, were produced by pecking, which involves, it's a technique which involves striking the rock surface uh, with a stone tool, uh, such as a large river washed pebble to create uh, a desired shape. And the carvings are typically found on flat or gently sloping surfaces on low lying outcrops or boulders in the open landscape. And they were, they're often, today, they're often situated around farmland or on hillsides of rough grazing and moorland. And you can see some, some good examples of the, the, the location of them um, in the images here. Next slide, please. Um, Scotland's rock art is part of a wider prehistoric carving tradition, which is known elsewhere in Britain and Western Europe, especially in the island of Ireland, in Portugal and in Spain. Um, but similar motifs are also found in Scandinavian countries and in other parts of Europe um, occasionally. Because of this distribution, it's known as Atlantic rock art, and it appears to reflect kind of connectivity and sharing of knowledge in prehistory ac across the Atlantic region. So rock art was a prolific and significant part of Scotland's prehistoric landscape, and it represents an important source of archaeological information for enhancing our understanding of the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. Yet we still know really very little about it, about why it was created, about how it was used, and what role it played in people's lives in the past. Rock art is also an important part of our historic environment today, but there's low public awareness and the vast majority of panels are vulnerable and neglected in the landscape. There's been some, no, can you go back, back on? There's been some, Joanna, can you, thank you. There's been some fantastic research in recent years, led especially by Professor Richard Bradley and Professor Andy Jones. Um, and this, this work has provided new perspectives and insights on Scotland's rock art, but there's still much to do and much that we don't know. Previous research has focused um, on a few specific panels or on particular areas such as Kilmartin. So we don't have an understanding of the wider picture for rock art across the whole, the whole country or how it relates to the kind of archeological narrative for whole, the whole of Scotland. One of the main constraints on rock art research is the quality of the data. And as Richard Bradley has noted, there are very few regions where rock art has been recorded sufficiently to enable full analysis. Although the existing record is a fantastic resource in many respects, because it's been created over 200 years by many different people with different agendas and different techniques, it is inconsistent, it's sometimes inaccurate, and it often lacks the detail and the visual imagery that's so vital for research. Next slide, please, now. Okay. Um, Scotland's Rock Art Project then was established uh, to address issues with the, with the rock art data and low public awareness. The overarching aim of the project was to enhance understanding and appreciation of Scotland's rock art through community co-production co and research. We had five key project objectives revolving around community co-production. First of all, to work with our community teams to record rock art across the country and generate a detailed database suitable for research. Second, to use this database and 3D models co-produced with the community teams for spatial and statistical analysis of Scotland's rock art. And Joanna and Linda have been working really hard on this over the last 18 months or so. Thirdly, to make the database, the digital images and the 3D models available to others for research, management, education and awareness through our website and through Canmore, which is the record for Scotland's historic environment. 
Freddie, our digital archivist, has been really busy over the last nine months ensuring that all our data are now properly archived within Historic Environment Scotland's digital archives and are publicly accessible on Canmore in the longer term. There's been very little research into the cultural significance of rock art today. So Stuart, um, as you've met, our co-I from Glasgow School of Art, has been working with our community teams over the last few years to explore how and why they value rock art and how this sense of value changes through closer engagement um, with rock art during recording. And finally, an important part of the project has been to raise awareness with Scotland's rock art uh, with different audiences, locally, nationally and internationally. And we've been doing this through a whole range of activities and events, such as um, these webinars, talks to local societies, guided walks, conference presentations, academic and non-academic publications, radio and TV coverage, social media, and also things like our photography challenge aimed at in encouraging wider engagement. But in this talk, uh, we'll just be focusing on the first two objectives. I'll talk first a bit about um, how we've been recording rock art, then I'll hand over to Joanna and Linda to talk about our analysis. So in 2017 and 2018, we ran a series of training courses across Scotland for anyone interested in recording and 3D modelling rock art. This resulted in the formation of 12 community teams covering a large part of the country, including many areas with concentrations of rock art. There's just a couple of acronyms that I should explain um, on this slide. Um, ELF um, stands for Edinburgh, Lothians and Fife team, and ACFA stands for the Association of Certificated Field Archaeologists, who uh, formed three teams working uh, to the north, south and the west of Glasgow. Our community teams worked autonomously most of the time with support from us where needed, but they also worked closely with us um, in certain areas to systematically record the rock art. And members of the scrap team also did field work in areas that weren't covered by our community teams, so places like the Western Isles and parts of Aberdeenshire, to ensure that we had a good sample of rock art data covering the whole country. In 2018 and 2019, we also ran two field schools for archaeology students, mainly from Edinburgh University, um, to help us record the very large number of panels in the Kilmartin area, alongside also our Kilmartin team. And in 2019, together with members of several of our community teams and students from Glasgow School of Art, we worked with Dr Kenny Brophy and the Faithley community to locate and record all the rock art around Faithley, just north of Glasgow. So what did the field work involve? Well, um, th this, what we did during the field work was to relocate and record known panels and also look for previously unrecorded ones. We all used a standardised recording methodology to collect consistent data for each rock art panel we located. So this included a range of techniques designed to capture considerable detail and visual information about the carvings, about the rocks on which they were carved and about their physical and archaeological setting. We collected, uh, for example, accurate grid references, which was essential not only for our analysis, but also for, for our future research and management. And we used a specially designed recording form to quantify and describe things like the landscape setting, the rock type, the dimensions, slope and orientation of the panel, natural features on the rock surface, the number and the type of motifs and so on. And we made sketch plans of the panel and its location and also took a series of photographs of the panel and its setting from different orientations. A very important part of the recording methodology was to create 3D models of each panel we located. The technique we used, we, we used called, which was called structure from motion photogrammetry, involved taking a large number of overlapping photos of the whole rock from different positions, and then processing these using a, a specific software. Um, we used something called Agisoft Metashape. We then uploaded the 3D models to the online platform Sketchfab, where, we, where they were publicly accessible. And you can see them on our Sketchfab account. I think Guillaume is just posting uh, the link to that in the chat if you're interested. This 3D modeling technique is, fan fantastic, um, is fantastic for large scale community led rock art recording. It, it's relatively quick and easy to use in the field. 
it's objective so everybody produces the same result and it doesn't impact on the rock surface so that's all absolutely crucial the models can be digitally enhanced um, to reveal faint carvings and details that are not visible in the field or in normal photographs so things like superimposed motifs you can see a couple in the bottom left image there also things like very eroded carvings and traces of lines and pecking showing how people had interacted with the rock surface and also sequences of carving activity um, so in the bottom bottom right image you can see a very short groove coming out from the cut mark cutting through the outer ring the, the, the concentric rings um, so this groove was added at a later stage after the concentric rings so this technique is um, incredibly valuable for research as it enables detailed scrutiny of the carvings and their relationship to the rock surface. And Joanna will be talking uh, more about how we've used this information in our analysis um, shortly. So all the data and the images recorded in the field were uploaded to our database via our website. Um, the, the records were validated by members of the scrap team and then became publicly accessible and you can search and view all the scrap records and 3D models on our website um, with, the, with the website addresses there. So overall, we and our community teams together investigated uh, 1630 panels across Scotland. Um, you can see the distribution of the panels that we investigated um, on the map on the right, um, which they're showing red dots, and the blue dots are the panels that we didn't investigate. So you can see that we've got a pretty good coverage of the whole country. Unfortunately, COVID uh, rather disrupted our fieldwork programme, um, and if we hadn't been locked down, we would have been able to record far more, possibly somewhere in the region of 2,400 panels. Most of the, the panels that we investigated were existing records, which we revised, updated and enhanced. Um, but there were also 250 new discoveries, including this lovely one shown here, which is from Whitelaw Hill in East Lothian, discovered by Douglas Leddingham of our ELF team. Not all the panels that we investigated were recorded in detail. Um, around 300 were not located, um, either possibly they were covered by vegetation, they may have been destroyed or moved, or the grid references were so inaccurate that it was impossible to find them. And a further 215 panels that we investigated were revealed not to be rock art. Most of these were natural features um, that were previously recorded as ring marks, um, or there were later human-made features. So in total, then, we have 1,110 detailed rock art records in our database and over 1,000 3D models. So this is a fantastic resource for our analysis and also for others um, to study, to use and to build on well into the future. So I'll, I'll stop here for now and I'll pass you over to Joanna to talk about how we've been using uh, this database for our analysis. Thank you, Tersha. Um, so as Tersha mentioned, SCRAP is also about research and to contribute to a better understanding of prehistoric rock art in Scotland. And uh, there are still many unanswered questions about this type of rock art um, from an accurate chronology to its social role. So there are many basic questions such as who created the rock art, what and for and when that we don't have straightforward answers for. So to carry out our research, we defined four main questions to address, exploring the incredibly detailed and unprecedented data set created through the extensive fieldwork across the country and the analysis of that data. So we were really in, in a privileged position to be able to contribute to this discussion with such a large data set. So the main question, one of the, rather the, the, the first question that we wanted to address is obviously chronology. Um, which the project did not, not fully address, and later I will explain why. Um, and we really don't know uh, when, uh, we don't have exact, exact data uh, to, uh, to um, know when this rock art was created. We don't have uh, 
pigments to uh, be able to date accurately with um, scientific methods. Uh, but I will be I will be discussing this a little bit further uh, down the line. The second question is about the character of prehistoric rock art in Scotland. That is, what are the main characteristics defining this type of rock art? Um, the third question is um, also trying to understand the striking differences in the rock art distribution across the country. You may have noticed in the, from, from the maps shown so far um, that, sorry, I just noticed that I'm having some technical issues. I'm apolog apologies for the, uh, the, the slide flicking. Um, so why is the rock art so uneven across the, uh, across the country? And finally, we wanted to know who created the rock art and what it was for. In practical terms, our approach was based on a three scale methodology to address different components of the rock art. We have a small scale of analysis focusing on the motifs, particularly looking at their morphology and their design, the variations within the images, um, but also the carving techniques and the type of the depiction. Um, as a medium scale of analysis was looking at the rock media, that is the rocks on which the motifs were carved, their physical characteristics, but also the organization of the motifs on the rock surface, the compositions themselves, and the interaction between the motifs um, and, the, and the natural features of the rocks. And finally, at a, large, at a large scale, we were looking at patterns of landscape location, for example, the relationship between the rock art and natural elements, as well as contemporary monuments that surround the rock art. And we, uh, we were aiming to explore uh, a range of uh, a range of, uh, of variables to confirm or dispel some assumptions that were carried uncritically throughout the research biography of this type of rock art regarding its landscape location. For example, there is this idea that um, Atlantic rock art was deliberately created in places um, with specific types of visibilities or intervisibilities uh, or even uh, relationships to rootways. So each of these scales of analysis was decomposed in a number of variables, some of which you can see here on your screen. And um, I will be talking about the medium, the small and medium scales of analysis, and then Linda will uh, discuss the large scale of analysis uh, relating to the uh, landscape location of the rock art. And then in the end, we will discuss how uh, this was all um, combined and, uh, and brought together. So I will start with the uh, small scale of analysis. And just to give you an idea, this is uh, the nature of the data set that we were using. So we, uh, for, the, for, the, for this scale of analysis, we were looking specifically at the motifs. Um, and so we were uh, analyzing 902 panels that were distributed according um, to this this uh, table, as you can see, and um, I would I would I would have to say that much of this classification work was done by Lucy Kaloran, who did a wonderful job at decomposing uh, hundreds of panels and classifying almost sixteen thousand individual motifs that were um, found on the panels. For this work, the three D models were really essential because they allowed to. Um, look at the, uh, the motifs more clearly and identify um, details that would otherwise not be visible to us. So some of you may have already seen this, uh, this picture, um, this table. So this is, this is a subset of our um, categorical scheme. So the motifs are obviously the most visual and obvious component of the rock art, and they have since early times been the focus of much attention from, from uh, researchers focusing on this, on this uh, type of rock art. Um, but then uh, the analysis of the motifs became slightly sidelined with the introduction of Atlantic rock art in the, 19, in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, and uh, and recently we have realized that it is actually important to go back to those to that analysis of the motifs and to look at them in more detail. So the motif classification process is quite complex and of course biased. Um, the good thing is that we only had two people doing this classification, so we had Lucy Kaloran and myself, and so the bias is relatively consistent. The classification is also a way of organizing the motifs for our research. And the way that we deconstructed the compositions 
may have meant nothing to the people who actually created the rock art. However, it really helped us to understand the detail um, of, the, uh, of the carvings. So what you see, as I said in this image, is a subset of this classification scheme, which is a lot more, um, it's more extensive than this. And in total, we have uh, 13 main categories of motifs, which you can see on the left side of the table. Each of these is subdivided into several attrib attributes depending on the variations that we identified for each of them. So for example, if you look at uh, the, the motifs that are inside this, uh, this rectangle, this is the, uh, the category of gapped rings, you will see that the circles are not only gapped, but they can, they can be uh, gapped with or without a, cup, a central cup mark, they can, they can have extended legs, they can have uh, converging ends, they can be open on one side and not on the other. So there is a lot of variation that we took into account. These are very small details in the making process of Atlantic rock art, but they tell us that the cup and rings are not just simply cup and rings, but are filled with nuance. Um, and they also tell us that we are not dealing with just random copies of the motifs, not, not random copies of the rock art, but instead we are dealing with a tradition that was intentionally similar and consistent. And this suggests that it was carefully taught and also passed on to others. So if we look at the main motif categories, we can see that there is a lot of variation across the country. Um, this is a presence absence motif chart, which is showing which are which of these motif categories are present in each of the regions that are indicated in the bottom um, axis. You will you will notice that I put a north arrow because I organized the uh, the study areas according to their geographical position, uh, and I think that later you will um, see why, as the uh, the trends start to kind of emerge, the, the patterns start to emerge. So from this chart, we can immediately see that the cut mark variant is very dominant and is present in all of the study areas, and that the cut marks are also the only motifs that we identified in Tyree and the Western Isles. Although the Western Isles there has a um, the presence of a radial variant because we also identify the cut mark with a radial uh, there, which accounts for that gray uh, line there. All the other areas have circles and radials, grooves, um, which were often used to interconnect motifs. And uh, there, are, you can see that there are also rosettes, keyholes and spirals um, in some of the areas. And uh, we will find out later that these are actually quite rare uh, and only identified in these specific regions. Now, if we, oops, sorry, here we go. Um, so these trends become even more obvious when we look at the percentages of the occurrence of the motifs for each for each region, and you can see that the overwhelming um, pattern that is coming across is the presence of cup marks. They form the majority of motifs that we have. Um, and if you look at the rosettes and the keyholes and the spirals, they almost disappear on the top of these lines. They are really just very, very um, almost insignificant numbers when compared to cup marks and also uh, circle variants. And uh, even when we eliminate the cup marks from this equation, we can see that um, you know, we still have quite a consistent picture here. We, we still see a majority of circle variants and grooves uh, and the rosettes, keyholes and these more specialized motifs are all uh, very in very minimal numbers on the top. This means that looking at the carving tradition at this scale, it looks very homogenous across the country with a few exceptions of Tyree and the Western Isles where the rock art is consistently dominated by cup marks only. However, if we look in more detail at some of the categories, we are able to identify regional variations and, and preferences. And this is, this is where the, the use of a categorical scheme like the one that we are, that we are um, employing here really comes across the, 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 the need or how useful it can be for us to understand um, the, the rock art. So particularly regarding the category of cup and ring motifs, you can see that there's a lot of variation. It's interesting to note that some of the most specialized motifs were only identified in specific regions. For example, the cup and rings with converging ends is only present in Kilmartin, Perthshire and Dumfries and Galloway, or the cup and rings with unusually 
large central cups were identified only in Angus, Argyle, and Dumfries and Galloway, or the cup and rings with conjoint ends in Kilmartin, Bute, Perthshire, and Dumfries and Galloway. And there's even uh, the very unusual erased motifs, which are only identified in Kilmartin and Perthshire, um, Stirlingshire and Dumfrey, and Dumfries and Galloway. These are areas with more elaborate rock art, as you know. And these erased motifs are uh, or were initially identified in Ireland. So this level of detail is also being able to uh, point to differences and similarities, inform us about differences and similarities between the regions and suggest connections between them as well. So the detail of the motifs is very fine. And when combined to the, with the other components of the rock art, such as the carving techniques and where they were, they were created, it's really suggesting this wide understanding of the tradition, which was certainly very important. And so when we look at uh, the data on a map, we know that our data set is slightly uneven because we have more data to the western part of Scotland than the east. Uh, but our, our studies are showing that there seems to be a transition area around Perthshire, which is establishing a slight difference between the north and the south, uh, with the north being characterized by much, much more simple compositions or, or simpler types of motifs um, than the south. Uh, and obviously, in this case, the, uh, the, the, west, the western coast. Interestingly, much of this elaborate, uh, more elaborate rock art is, in, in the south um, shares a lot of, a lot of um, similarities with other parts of Atlantic Europe as well. So moving on to another variable or, uh, of, of, the, of the small scale, um, as I said, our, our data set is, slight, is slightly uneven. uneven. Um, oops, sorry, this is the wrong. Yeah, okay. So um, the, type, the type of depiction is essentially assessing the way in which the motifs were carved on the rocks and their relationship with the surface's microtopography. So we have a planar type of, of carving uh, where the motifs are largely unresponsive to the rock surface and are essentially um, carved as a two-dimensional, with a two-dimensional character. Then we have a plastic uh, style where the motifs are slightly more responsive and begin to incorporate certain natural features such as fissures and solution holes into the compositions. And then we have a 3D style of motifs um, where they embrace the microtopography of the rock surface resulting in almost 3D images as you can see here on your right side. These often have deeper grooves and they are a bit more complex in the way that they were molded to the rocks. So although there are really good fantastic, um, really fantastic examples of 3D rock art such as this example on the bottom right of Glassy One in Perthshire, the majority of the rock art was categorized as either planar or plastic. However, this does show that Atlantic rock art often takes advantage of the rock surface and um, finding the right texture to create the motifs could have been a really important motivation behind the decision of where to carve. It's also interesting to note that 3D types of carvings are nevertheless present in almost all of the case studies, including the Highland, uh, where the rock art is more, more uh, composed of, of cup marks or that despite the proximity to Kilmartin and Dumfries and Galloway, this 3D, this 3D character is not very popular in Butte. And so we're now going to move to the medium scale of analysis, which deals with uh, the types of rocks or the rocks where the motifs were carved. Because Atlantic rock art had such a strong relationship with the rock surface, the characteristics of these panels could be crucial for the selection of where of where to carve them. And so at this scale, we are looking at the rock type. So whether they were carved on boulders or outcrops, geological features, textures, colors, and how the carvings in interacted with this natural dimension of the, uh, of the medium. The scale of analysis will also look at um, the relationships between the motifs themselves and the rock surface. So starting with the, uh, with the panel type, what we see is uh, a, a slight preference for outcrops over boulders. 
But at the same time, we also see kind of a, a pattern emerging. If, if you look, if you look at the map, you can see that the boulders, which are in, in red color, seem to be more focused in the northern part of the country, whereas the, the blue color representing the outcrops is more focused on the south. So again, this is a trend that seems to be accompanying this, um, well, the rock art itself, the patterns that are emerging from the rock art, uh, almost as if the north, you have uh, the boulders with lots of cup marks and then outcrops in the south with more um, complex type of rock art. The relationship with the rock surface uh, was assessed and also demonstrated through this category of uh, structural variants. The majority of the attributes in this, in this category aim to characterize how the motifs interacted with the natural features. Um, and so we looked at fissures, solution holes, and also the edges of the rocks. Whether the motifs adjoined or truncated uh, these features, we, um, or whether they were an integral part of the compositions as it often happened. So even the edges of the panels were sometimes shaped to accommodate the designs of the motifs. Um, and the fissures, as you can see, and as you can see uh, down here in this image, could be used to divide or enclose uh, motifs. They could be transformed into radials. Also, solution holes could be transformed transformed into cut marks um, and so on. This category also assessed how the motifs were structured on the rock surface and in relation to each other, whether connected by grooves, conjoined or superimposed. In fact, uh, superimpositions were relatively rare or practically unknown in Atlantic rock art. And, we've, and with the 3D models, we've been able to find um, a few examples of this and show that there were actually some superimpositions in this uh, type of rock art as well. Um, so this, this chart is just showing that even in places like the Western Isles, we have the presence um, of these relationships. So even there we have fissures, truncating motifs uh, or panel edges being part of the compositions. Moving forward, we are now looking at the uh, <clears throat> compositional subclasses, which is another way that we use to analyze the spatial organization and the distribution of the carvings on the rock surface. The panels were then organized according to seven attributes from simple to single or single to, um, to simple clustered prominence irregular as you can read there, um, depending on how they were displayed on, on the rock surface. Um, here, this is, a, this is a, a, a category where we didn't quite find any patterns emerging, um, but in some cases, we tend to think that the rock art can be really sophisticated because we are used to seeing lots of images of, you know, panels like Ormeg, Achnebreg in Kilmartin, or even Drumtrodden in Dumfries and Galloway. But effectively, the majority of the panels are actually composed of single cup marks or cup and ring marks um, in simple compositions, often depicted in isolation on the rock surface. So really what we're looking here is a rock art that has a preference for simplicity um, in, in many ways, with the majority of rocks being carved with simple arrangements of one to two motifs. And this is a tendency that had been noted uh, by um, previous, previous researchers, but that we were able to demonstrate. Um, the motive range, this simplicity also came across in, in, this, uh, in the motive range, which essentially uh, looks at the repetition of, of the motifs on the, uh, the, the rock surfaces. So regardless of how many times they are repeated, sometimes we have panels with just cup marks, which would fall on this uh, dominant um, attribute where we only have one single motif type being carved uh, or two to four or five motif types if, if um, is a varied composition. Um, and the dominant attribute, which you can see in green, is more prevalent in the majority of the regions. Um, although towards the south, the situation becomes more balanced with more panels carved with a wider range of motifs. And this is particularly the case for Stirlingshire, the Lothians and Dumfries and Galloway, as you can see here, which is perhaps is not so surprising considering that 
these areas um, have rock art panels that are a little bit more complex. So I'm now going to uh, pass on to Linda, uh, who will be talking to us about the landscape. Thank you, Joanna. So now moving on to the last scale of analysis, which involves the landscape. Um, the reason why we're focusing on the landscape is because it's considered to be a defining element of Atlantic rock art. And certainly when we think about how rock art gets created, um, the decision of where to carve would have been one of the first steps, even if the defining element of the tradition uh, were the actual carvings or the motifs. So we looked at a wide range of variables that would inform us of um, the wider landscapes in which the rock art is located. Um, these are specific natural and cultural contexts of the rock art, which allowed us to gain a holistic understanding of location. Uh, you see these variables listed on this slide. Um, for example, we looked at local geology, which is um, important since some rocks have different levels of hardness. Some could be more or less appropriate for carving. They could have certain characteristics such as shininess or other things that make them appealing in many different ways. We also looked at the inclination of the terrain um, or the slope in which the panels are located because this, is, uh, this has implications of how accessible the panels are. Um, and in turn, that also determines, for instance, how many people can gather around a rock art panel. The orientation of the panels or the aspects um, also plays an important role if, for instance, people were supposed to look over specific features of the landscapes or other contemporary sites such as funerary monuments. Uh, similarly, previous research has assumed that a wide visibility over the landscape is a defining feature of a rock art location, as Joanne has already mentioned, um, as well as visibility from the landscape towards the panels or intervisibility between carvings. It has also been assumed that rock art is related to root waves and patterns of mobility across the landscape. So in our research, we set out to confirm or dispel some of these assumptions using a range of computational methods um, that would help us to quantify and demonstrate our conclusions in a scientific way. So this included uh, using Geographic Information System, or GIS. GIS is a system that would allow us to create, manage, analyze, and map all types of spatial data. And uh, to better grasp this re regionality of the rock art, we selected 16 topographically defined case study areas across Scotland. These were then used in the spatial analysis. These are areas where the rock art um, is contained and clustered but it also contains enough panels to actually make analysis feasible. We also made sure that we covered different topographic areas um, so that we would represent the regional diversity within Scotland. The data was then filtered to only include in situ panels, so that's panels which are still in their original location. Since we are interested in knowing what the location of the rock art is and what it's characterized by, we could only include those panels where we were certain that they had not been moved. So the numbers that you see on the list is um, a count of how many in situ panels were available in each area. So I don't have time to go into each variable in detail, but I will present some of the more interesting results. And I will start with elevation, like you can see here. So the chart on this slide shows the proportion of rock art which fall into three different elevation intervals. We have zero to 150 meters above sea level, 150 to 300, and then 300 to 500 meters above sea level. In most areas, you see that panels are located in heights below 300 meters. In some some areas this may be determined by the local topography, but in others it does seem to be a deliberate decision. There have been several study, studies suggesting that this type of rock art was preferentially located in mid slopes, and this is what the elevation data is also suggesting. We have confirmed this preference with testing for significance, and I will come back to this point later on. Another variable that we looked at uh, was slope or the inclination of the terrain. Uh, this also revealed some interesting trends. So to simplify things, we classified slope into five categories. These categories take into 
account the environmental and ecological uh, factors when determining hilltop profiles. So the chart that you see on the left um, shows the majority of panels falling within medium slopes. There's also a significant proportion in accentuated slopes. And while these accentuated slopes actually tend to be on the lower end of the interval, however, but in general, it is considered that optimal arable farming locations fall within 0 to 12% inclination. Slopes greater than 20% would only be suitable for grazing and forestry practices. Based on these slope values, there may therefore have been a link between rock art and domesticated areas of the landscape. The map on the right shows the concentration of rock art near Ben Lors on Loch Tay in Perth and Kinross. Uh, the black dots are the ones we use for the spatial analysis in this area, and the white dots represent the entire scrap data set. And we can see that this area actually exemplifies this general trend that the chart on the left is uh, demonstrating, where most panels fall within medium slopes and a smaller number in accentuated slopes. Another uh, variable we investigated was aspect or the di direction of the terrain. Um, we found that a large number, around 25% of the rock art panels, were located on south facing slopes. Sometimes they have variations towards the southeast or southwest, but they very hardly ever face north. And this trend extends across the whole of Scotland and seems to have been deliberate. You can see it quite clearly on the chart to the right, which shows the proportion of panels falling in different directions per area. One possible explanation could be related to the nature of sunlight um, on southern slopes at certain times of the day or in specific periods of the year, the rock art could become more obvious than under more typical lighting conditions. And we also know that the amount of sunlight that a slope receives also influences the vegetation that grows on the said slope. As a result, the prominence and thus the perception of rock art with so many panels being low lying and flat is drastically altered. On Butte, which you can see on the map to the left, the majority of panels fall within southwestern and southern slopes. And again, an example of this general trend we are seeing across Scotland. But as I will show a bit later on, these observations may not always be significant. We have to ask ourselves, is this observation unique for rock art or actually just a general reflection of the terrain? Another aspect of landscape location that we spent quite a bit of time on is visibility. So traditionally, visibility has been investigated through viewshed analysis in GIS. A viewshed analysis is essentially a calculation of the area that is visible from a location. It is quite a useful method for capturing visibility in an objective and quantitative way. You can modify the algorithm of the viewshed in several ways. So you can add an observation height, you can add a target height or a radius, which would limit the extent of the viewshed. The image on the right does visualize how analysis looks like in real terms. If you add single viewsheds generated for a single point altogether, you get a cumulative viewshed. So the cumulative viewshed allows you to see how many sites or observers share the same area of visibility. On the left, you see a cumulative viewshed for the rock art panels, which lie just north of Port of Menteith. The areas that are yellow are seen by between 40 and 45 panels. So that's almost all of them because we have 46 panels here in total. And the dark blue areas are seen by 10 or less panels. So at a small scale, we see that visibility is oriented towards the characteristic parallel ridges in this area. But at a larger scale, uh, the visibility tends to see appears to be quite focused towards the south, almost forming this corridor. And this uh, sort of direction seems very deliberate and our testing for significance actually confirmed this. And it shows that the rock art in this area does have higher visual properties than average. But what is actually being viewed? What we found is that uh, this cumulative viewshed is actually overlapping with the Flanders moss. So this is a raised bog, which is rich in environmental resources. It lies just to the southwest and southeast of the Lake of Menteith um, within the low-lying floodplain of the Forth Estuary. 
And Flanders moss formed over 8,000 years ago. It has remained mostly unchanged. We have to ask, how did people in the Neolithic and early Bronze Age interact with this important resource for flora and fauna? And how do the rock art panels nearby relate to this prehistoric activity? Interestingly, there are antiquarian accounts of wooden tracks preserved within and across um, the moss. And these are reminiscent of other wooden tracks from the Neolithic Bronze and Iron Age in Britain. In 1999, AOC Archaeology also excavated a small wooden platform here, which was dated to the early Neolithic, just where the pin is showing. It was suggested that this platform acted as a preparation area for hunting and gathering, um, which took place across the fen and the salt marshes at the time. So if the panels were created at the same time as people were exploiting Flanders moss, and furthermore, when they were building and using this infrastructure across the bogland, what purpose do the panels serve? One potential theory could be that the movement between these different areas of the landscape contributed to the configuration of, of it. On that note, another area we focused on was mobility. So as I mentioned, it's been argued that rock art was related to roofways across the landscape, and this was largely based on the observation of rock art sites near modern pathways. However, it is quite difficult to demonstrate a clear association between rock art and paths, um, because we have to remember that these paths would have been highly variable in the past. We use different computational uh, methods to simulate mobility patterns. Um, you can see an example of it on the right. While I don't have much time to go into technical detail here, I am very happy to answer any questions later on. So what you see are so-called least cost paths. These are essentially the calculation of the shortest paths between a source and a destination. And this helps us to understand how people may have moved across the landscape. As a special case study, we examined how rock art, funerary monuments, and standing stones in Kilmartin compared spatially to this network of paths. And this can be determined through the popularity of location. So in other words, how often a path in this net network crosses a point in the landscape. The results showed that the relation between the mobility network and the rock art in Kilmartin was actually quite random. And this means that the rock art location was most likely not influenced by the paths. This is significant because it challenges the idea that rock art is always associated with pathways. In fact, it seems to be the opposite. In Kilmartin, at least, the rock art is located in areas that are likely to be less traveled. One of the densest routeways we identified in our analysis, and therefore one of the most popular ones, stretches across the ridges on the western side of Kilmartin Glen. Some of the Ormeg panels, which you may be familiar with, lies within this area, and described sometimes as being one of the most isolated rock art panels in Scotland, it is interesting to think that perhaps in a prehistoric landscape, or may, may have actually been one of the more frequently encountered rock art sites. In terms of the standing stones, they show more intentionality in relation to the path. So in Kilmartin Glen and Kilmichael Glassery, the standing stones are accompanying routeways. We see that the standing stones, um, for example, follow an east-west alignment. Standing stones tend to therefore be located in more popular areas uh, than the rock art. And the statistical tests show that the relationship between standing stones and paths is not random and therefore most likely not caused by chance. This is interesting because it shows how rock art and standing stones, which were probably contemporary monuments, were located in different areas of the landscapes. It seems that standing stones at least were far more suited to be navigational markers than rock art. This is even more so the case with funerary monuments such as chambered cairns. They have the highest popularity scores compared to rock art and standing stones. There seems to be a much stronger relation between funerary monuments and paths, which is not random. And it is, it is interesting that we are seeing very clear differences in how rock art, funerary monuments and standing stones relate to this network of paths. This could potentially relate to different modes of perception. So perhaps the funerary monuments were meant to be encountered more frequently than, for example, rock art, or perhaps their varying popularity symbolizes a specific structuring of the landscape. 
So me and Joanna have presented a wide range of variables and results so far, and I don't blame you if you feel slightly overwhelmed by it all. Whilst we have started to identify some, some key trends in, in the data, as we have demonstrated, we needed to also find some quantitative methods for classifying this huge amount of data and actually recognizing some key patterns, because this would allow us to critically reflect on the pre preliminary interpretations and also strengthen the argument. So we employed two kinds of techniques for this. Uh, we employed a multiple component analysis, also known as MCA, and a multiple response permutation procedure, MRPP. Again, I won't be going into much technical details here, but happy to answer any questions. But in both cases, we ran the analysis three times. So we first ran it using only the variables associate, associated with the motif analysis. Then we ran it a second time only using the landscape variables and a third time using all variables combined. This was to see how and to what extent the different scales of analysis actually influence any clustering and patterning within the data. So I'll start off with the MCA results first. What the MCA does is that it um, analyzes the data according to similarity. So what you see on this slide is clusters that have been identified based on the MCA. When we look at only the motifs, which is the left image, you can notice that there seems to be two main clusters. These are not regionally defined. In other words, panels for both clusters um, occur in the same areas. Uh, when using only the landscape variables, which is the middle image, we see this changing quite drastically. So now there are suddenly four big clusters and these correspond roughly to geographic regions. So cluster one is largely defined to Dumfries and Galloway. Cluster three is mainly around Loch Tay. Cluster, cluster four is mostly Perthshire and Highland. And cluster two is sort of everywhere. When we combine the motif and landscape variables, which is what you see on the right, we get a more dispersed version of the first plot. This means that the homogeneity we see within the motifs is actually broken up by the heterogeneity of the landscape variables. And interestingly, the MRPP shows the exact same trend. So the MRPP um, is essentially a matrix which describes dissimilarity within and between groups. And this is what we're interested in because we want to see how the different regions compare. If we assume that there is a difference between regions, then the panels within an area should be more similar to each other than to panels in other areas. And the MRPP can be used to produce a heat map that illustrates precisely this. And this is what you see on this slide. So the value on the scale uh, refers to the scale of the similarity, where zero means identical and one means completely different. Again, we ran the MRPP three times, first only with the motif variables, then with the landscape variables, and then a third time with everything combined. If there is a clear group structure in the data, we would expect to see the lowest values, so that would be dark blue, going horizontally. But when looking at only the motifs, so the left image, this is certainly not the case. And this makes sense because thinking back results from the MCA, the motifs aren't regionally defined. In other words, there is not a clear regional group structure when we only considered the type of motifs. Looking at the landscape on the middle image, however, we get a much stronger grouping coming through. With the example of Tyree, for example, you can see that the landscape location is so unique that it stands out from most other regions, which is why it comes out as dark blue. When we combine the motifs with the landscape, which is the right image, again, we see group structure materializing, but slightly less strongly than when we just consider the landscape. Now, one of the critical questions here in response to these results is, are we simply not just capturing the regional variation of the Scottish landscape rather than something intentional? I have mentioned a couple of times earlier how we have tested for significance, and I will expand a little bit on that now. So earlier, I also questioned whether some general trends we have made regarding slope, elevation and aspect are actually important. In order to know whether our findings are significant or not, we employed significance testing. So this 
common procedure and statistics and allows you to either support or reject your claims. Our null hypothesis is that if these variables were not important for the rock art, then the relationship between rock art and a variable is a product of chance. This is the hypothesis that we aim to reject. We therefore tested the significance of these variables in each area against a thousand random points. And the results are presented here. Um, and it demonstrates whether a variable is significant, yes or not, no. The data shows that, that there is a great variance um, in the significance of variables depending on the regions. Very few regions actually follow the same pattern. And when they do, these areas are not always located in similar landscapes. One thing that really comes through is the significance of elevation in almost all areas. This means that the rock art was located in specific locations within the landscape and not just anywhere. So whilst, yes, we are seeing some regional uh, variation having an effect on the way that data is perceived, we can also clearly detect some intentionality when it comes to certain features of the landscape. And this is what results in a very unique identity for each rock art grouping. I will now pass over to Joanna for some conclusive remarks and perhaps some answers to our questions. Thanks, Linda. Um, okay, can you hear me okay? Great. So I know that we are running a little bit late and I hope that you're all hanging in there, but we're just about to wrap up. And um, now that we have discussed our methodology and some of our results, I will be returning to the research questions that we set out in the beginning of the webinar and answer some, if not all of them. So in terms of um, chronology, it's safe to say that it is still problematic. So as I said, we did not carry out any archeological excavations, which are much needed. Um, and regardless of that, of that, of that issue, uh, we are firmly convinced that this type of rock art in Scotland was produced and used during the local Neolithic. The rock art probably reaches a peak of production during the late Neolithic. So between 3,000, 3, 2,450 BC and the Chalcolithic between 2,450 to 2,200, 2,150 BC. At this point, we're not sure if the creation of rock art ceased in the landscape, but we see a new phenomenon emerging uh, with the carvings being reused in um, early Bronze Age uh, burial contexts. And this is a period when we see an increase in the use of carved blocks uh, in, in, in these monuments, which probably announces a, a, a different perception towards the rock art. So people were relating with it in a different way. So for this conclusion, we have considered the excavations carried out or the results of the excavations that have been carried out so far, especially by Professor Richard Bradley and also Professor Andrew Jones in, in, in Torvlaren, in Clonlors in, in Lorte, and more recently in Urlar and Strathte. Um, and, and also the presence of uh, prehistoric activity that they have been finding in these contexts, as well as some um, radiocarbon dates. The carved blocks, we also looked at the carved blocks that were found in these funerary monuments, which indicate a period, of, um, a period of use, or at least when they stopped being created in the landscape uh, and, and were quarried to, to then be inserted in these structures. And here you have an example or a couple of examples. So on your left, you have Cairn Holy chambered cairns uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, one of which has a cup and ring motif that you can see here on a, on a stone that we think might be a capstone. And the other block, um, it's a kind of uh, rectangular, block with a cup and six rings deposited within the burial. But also the ladies in Aberdeenshire on your right, which was excavated in 1970, has provided what possibly, may, what may be the oldest um, uh, known carved stone in the context, although we know that there are issues with um, the radiocarbon dates from, from early, early periods. Uh, but either way, it was at the time dated to the fourth millennium BC. In addition, the spatial study that we've been carrying out has shown that there are some connections with other types of archaeological sites from this period. And there are areas where there is lots of Neolithic activity surrounding uh, the panels and areas where they were created. So places like Cairn Holy, again, there is um, in Dumfries and Galloway, there seems to be a dense prehistoric occupation 
that corroborates this idea, including not only the stone circles that are quite well known in that in that part of the country, but also we see panels very close to burned mounds and hut circles, which obviously we don't have direct datings for, but are considered to be prehistoric in many cases. Um, and also a number of interesting find spots that include polished axe heads and also barbed and tangent arrow heads, which are artifacts um, that, that uh, were in use during the Neolithic. And we have other, other examples like that. So for example, in North Lorte, uh, a lot of the rock art is located in areas where there are other Neolithic um, sites as well uh, in great um, spatial proximity and also find spots that include scrapers and whetstones, lots of flint, axe heads, um, and even a carved stone bowl and a jadeite, a jadeite polished axe head. So um, in terms of our question number two, uh, what is the character of prehistoric rock art in Scotland? So the small scale of analysis confirmed that the rock art is mostly created through pecking, as uh, Tosha had mentioned previously, although there may be some variations or combinations of, uh, of techniques, such as abrasion or even the creation of small adjacent cut marks that were then polished together. There's an overwhelming preference for cut marks, more accentuated in the north, where some regions are almost exclusively characterized by these motifs. And although we have dispelled the idea that regions such as the Scottish Highlands only have cut marks in, in their repertoire. Um, we have obviously identified other motifs there, uh, including some of those specialized designs that are more common to other regions and which uh, suggest and indicate that there may have been relationships between different parts of the territory. However, the rock art in the South is effectively more elaborate and there seems to be this divide in the country that I mentioned previously, somewhere around the central belt, dem dem demarcating a change in the motif preferences. Um, as I mentioned also, some of the rare and more specialized motifs were found particularly in the South um, and are also common to other areas such as Ireland. And they're not very well represented in the North of the country. And this poses the question whether uh, the rock art entered the territory from the Southwest and therefore had more time to mature in these areas, resulting in more elaborate panels, or is it just a matter of preference? Um, the medium scale of analysis revealed a preference for um, outcro outcrops over boulders. Um, and again, this preference varies regionally, uh, but, uh, and it accompanies this, uh, this pattern observed with the motifs. With the, with the boulders being more uh, typical to the north and outcrops to the south. And in this zone of transition, uh, we, we, this difference or this, this distinction of views between one and the other is not so striking. Although there are many well-known extensive carved rocks, um, extensively decorated carved rocks, uh, these are effectively a minority. And in fact, most of the rocks bear only a small number of motifs of simple um, and similar types, making this quite a thematic type of rock art. Um, and this is a decision that was no doubt related to the type of message that the artists were, were wanting to convey, and that could have could have different meanings depending on where the, 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 the rock art was carved in the landscape, and possibly the social status of whoever was interacting with the panels and observing them. So the majority of carvings, as I said, are planar or plastic in type, but they're, they are still responsive to the rock surface with some great examples of 3D technique identified in studies across the country. And this is particularly exciting because this 3D type of carving is a preference in other European regions with Atlantic rock art, such as Iberia. Um, and obviously, of course, the uh, identification of superimposition was very important for, for, um, for this characterization of, of this type of rock art and other ways of structuring the compositions, uh, namely with the use of natural features, which is definitely a defining character of this type of rock art. Um, although we don't see this overwhelming use of interconnecting uh, grooves like we do in other in other in other areas they are still there finally in terms of the landscape location there are a few patterns that were identified as linda described um, but in general the the results point to a variation of views which may be explained for a number of reasons in some cases due to environmental determinism 
that is they that they chose places to carve because essentially there were there were no other places available however in other cases there seems to be a deliberate choice a deliberate decision of where to place them and uh, Linda mentioned the case of the elevation, uh, which is quite striking of this intentional location of the rock art. Um, and obviously this would have an implication uh, regarding the accessibility of the rock art, but also the amount of people that would be able to gather around the carvings in one time. And perhaps this preference, um, perhaps this location was also uh, related to other factors. If we consider um, for example, that the majority of panels were avoiding uh, areas of peat coverage. Um, and so there seems to be, um, so looking at the other at, at the other variables, as Linda also, also discussed, there seems to be this preference for south facing slopes, um, which was also con confirmed to be deliberate in many of the case studies. And um, south facing slopes, as you may know, tend to receive more sunshine, which would then affect the type of vegetation growing around the rock art and also perhaps the type of animals that would be roaming um, in, in those areas. And ult ultimately, this vegetation would affect the visibility to and from the rocks. And the, the sunlight itself would also determine the visual impact of the rock art. So while these local factors seem to be quite important and determine the way the rock art was viewed, um, long distance visibility may have not been that important because if we consider that the panels were often small and um, low lying, perhaps they would not have been that visible, uh, especially if there was lots of vegetation growing around them. And also uh, we have to consider that the grooves would weather relatively quickly in the matter of two to five years and also the, um, the weather conditions and the atmospheric conditions, because, you know, um, I think that they would still have lots of gray skies like we do today. And uh, obviously this has a great impact in the way that we perceive the rock art. And if you have been out uh, doing field work, you will know um, how, how much harder it is when there is no uh, sunlight. So these finds are hinting at quite a private position of the rock art, despite being created out in the open. And this conclusion ties in well with the results from the mobility analysis, which revealed that in many cases, the rock art is located in areas detached from optimal routeways. And perhaps the rock art was not supposed to be found by others after all, and was just part of a much more private part of people's lives. However, we should remind ourselves of the regional variability and that there are no strict rules for any of these conclusions, which vary according to local preferences. So for example, in the areas of Lochte, Inverness, um, Port of Menteith, Mackers and Faithley, the testing for significance as Linda has shown, um, said that the relationship between rock art and optimal uh, pathways was very significant, but for instance, in Bew, Tyree, Kilmartin and Karen Holy, it came out as completely the opposite. Um, we've also looked at the coastline and we've assessed a model of, of coastal change created for several intervals of time created by uh, Duncan Guerra and Fraser Sturt. And this was a really interesting exercise because it informed us that in many cases, the rock art was a lot more coastal than what we know it, uh, we know it is today. So for instance, Kilmartin um, was quite striking because a lot of the rock art was really in a very coastal position. But for example, Tyree uh, at that time was probably divided in two. So there were two Tyrees, if you'd like. And the rock art is mostly focused on the southern part of that of, of those two islands. And so the MCA and the MRPP analysis that Linda mentioned um, and, and brought together, they essentially brought together uh, all these variables and the components of the rock art that were studied independently and in detail. Um, and they placed them in a very relational, um, or rather it was a, quite a relational approach because we were able to kind of place them in relation to each other in order to create this more comprehensive narrative of the rock art. And what it showed is that while the motifs were known widely, there are two main trends of groups of motifs, but little patterning emerging, which means that the iconography um, was used in a, a relatively homogeneous way across the country. But um, there are patterns emerging from the landscape analysis. And when these are combined with the motif analysis, then we see more variation, more local preferences, more differences and similarities between the regions that, 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 that we can tease out from this combined and relational approach. 
And so uh, I'm just going to move on to, oops, sorry. Okay. So the third question related to um, the distribution of rock art and why is it so uneasy? And there are, um, sorry, why is it so uneven? And so there are many reasons that may contribute for, um, for, for this. So in areas such as Faithley, which is around Glasgow, or the south of the country, we have a lot of demographic pressure and development, which may lead to the destruction of many panels. Um, on your right, there's the example of a very large panel, Greenland, uh, from, from the area of Glasgow, which had to be broken down into pieces and dismantled in the 1980s due to the proximity of a quarry. And this is quite um, obvious in our record, where in some in some of these regions, we hardly have any recorded rock art, such as the areas in, in well, the Lothians and, um, and so on. On the other hand, regions like the Highland have areas with barely any rock art. Um, and the reasons for this absence are still, well, are still reviewed. And, and we, we did um, investigate this to a certain point, but more needs to be done specifically um, or considering the relationship of or the impact of peat growth um, with the rock art which may be responsible for the disappearance of many panels uh, that perhaps are still there to, to be discovered. On the other hand other factors such as erosion may have contributed to this or simply research bias because there are uh, lots of areas that are very well known for, for the rock art such as Kilmartin and Galloway um, which attract continuous uh, research projects and are obviously paradigmatic of Scotland's rock art project, uh, sorry, so Scotland's rock art. Um, also, in Scotland, uh, there's been some very significant agricultural changes since the 17th century for land improvement, which may have led to the destruction or removal of carved rocks in this process. And finally, perhaps the prehistoric communities in the area did not have a practice of rock art or perhaps they were not interested in copying or following what their neighbors were doing. Um, and finally, the last question was about the social and cultural role of rock art. And as you know, it's really difficult to assess the social and cultural uh, role of rock art, given the lack of associated contexts in our case. However, if we look at what was happening at the time, we may perhaps be able to understand a little bit more um, where the rock art was fitting in people's lives. So the rock art was probably created at a time when a new way of life was introduced. The archaeological record shows that from 4,300 and 4,000 to 3,900, there were significant changes um, coming to place with the introduction of a range of monuments, uh, such as curses, chambered uh, tombs, but also practices, traditions, and other beliefs. And um, some researchers believe that these changes may have happened due to contacts with people coming particularly from places like France, uh, whilst others say that these were could have well been um, innovations developed by local populations. So in this context, we see the rock art being created across the landscapes of many territories. And um, our data is suggesting that it could have been used for a variety of purposes, depending on who was creating it and where. So in some areas, we see the rock art being produced in contexts which are seemingly removed from daily life areas. Um, perhaps where activities such as grazing were more common. And this is the case of Port of Menteith, where the rock art is completely isolated and the closest known monuments are located some eight kilometers away. In other areas, the data is indicating that rock art was part of a vibrant landscape where lots of activity of different types were taking place. Um, and so the rock art seemed to have been more linked to people's daily lives and activities, such as the case of Karen Holly that I mentioned previously, or even Butte, where uh, in some areas is located, spatially associated with funerary monuments, but others is more closely connected to settlements. So this variation reflects the nature of the Neolithic period itself, founded on this shift between um, a hunter fisher gather subsistence to an economy that was more reliant in livestock and cereal cultivation, accompanied by a number of technological and social novelties, uh, but which would have developed at different rhythms and therefore resulted in different and contrasting societies. However, the societies that uh, found the art of the cup and rings uh, meaningful and, and important enough, and they replicated extensively in their landscapes, um, but in a way that was meaningful to them. Uh, and so 
the result is sometimes very small and almost imperceptible differences that our methodology has been able to identify in the record. And these differences could have been in the way that the rock produced, but also where it was located or even um, when it was created and related to different events. Um, and so towards the late of the uh, uh, towards the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, as I have mentioned, there seems to be this dramatic change in the way people relate to the rock art, moving it from the landscape to the um, to the darkness of the burial chambers, which certainly also brought with itself or, or was or resulted from uh, important social transformations that we still don't understand. And um, again, this could have been um, due to more intensive contact with continental populations coming into Britain at this time, which, uh, as you know, brought um, the, uh, the beakers, the beaker phenomenon with it. Um, and so the message of the rock art probably changed here as well. And so variation accounts for faint cultural and social particularities of these groups that was using the rock art. And in a way they demonstrate the different identities that existed um, in these populations at that time. And uh, I'm, I'm going to finish here and I'm going to now pass on to Tosha who's just going to say goodbye to everyone, I think. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Joanna. Can we have the next slide? Um, so yes, everybody, uh, thank you for bearing with us. As, as I said at the beginning, we had a lot to say. Um, so just to, a, a couple of things to finish up. Um, the outcomes of our analysis, obviously it's a lot to take in in this talk, but the outcomes of our analysis and other aspects of our work, including the social value research, will be published in a series of academic journals <clears throat> in the next year or so. These will all be open access, so they'll be free for everybody to download. We're also planning to produce an atlas of Scotland's rock art, which will incorporate all our work and research outcomes. This book will take quite a lot longer to put together and to publish, so we're estimating uh, that it may be out in 2024. Um, it will also be open access and will be free for public download. If you want something more immediate to read and look at, and if you haven't seen it yet, you might be interested in our lovely new booklet, uh, which is just published last week, Prehistoric Rock Art in Scotland, Archaeology, Meaning and Engagement, and also the fabulous rock art learning resource, A Song in Stone, that we collaborated with Forestry and Land Scotland on, and was produced by Forestry and Land Scotland in March. Both of these are free to download from our website downloads page, um, which is um, the address is here, and I think Guillaume's putting it in the chat and of course you can search access and download all our data um, from our website and from Canmore anytime you want so it just remains then really to say a few thank yous uh, to everybody first of all um, we want to thank the Arts and Humanities Research Council for providing five years of funding for Scotland's Rock Art Project and to Historic Environment Scotland for hosting the project since 2017 but the project's really been made possible through the dedication and enthusiasm of all our community teams who've given their time and energy so, so freely and generously over the last few years. So we're grateful to them all, and you can see some of them here on the screen. We, we want also to thank all our colleagues, um, advisory board members and collaborators who've supported us so well during the project, and to everybody who's shared this journey with us. It's really been a fantastic experience and a great opportunity. And we hope that the project's legacy will live on um, and valuable for, for everybody for many years to come. Um, so just a final slide, if you want to contact us, sorry, we haven't had any time for questions today, but uh, if you want to contact us with questions about the talk, our emails are here. Uh, but please bear in mind that we only have just over a week before the Christmas break and the project ends at the end of the year. So um, get your questions in quick. Um, Joanna and I will be able to be back at Hess and we will be able to respond in January. So from myself and the rest of the Scrap team, Joanna, Linda, Freddie, Stuart, Guillaume and Maya, thank you all for listening and, um, and goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone.